It's actually kind of cold. Can I use the quilt quickly just to swat on some? Um, speaking of which, by the way, I, I think what I like most about your town here is the totally consistent weather. Um, we have a little saying in New York, a little quaint expression. I don't know if you guys use it here. We say, like, if you don't like the weather in New York, um, wait three months, because it'll be a new season and presumably colder or warmer. Um, I really want to thank uh, Chantal Strobel, the Deschutes County Library, uh, Deschutes, sorry, bad start with that one, uh, Foundation, the Novel Read Committee, everyone who's a sponsor, and of course all of you for coming here tonight. Um, I know you had Catherine Stockett, author of The Help Here last year, and before I begin, I, just, I, I feel a little self-conscious following her. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's the elephant in the room out of the way, I think we all know Compared with her book, um, you know, mine uh, got so much more attention and, and sales. <laughs> and lucrative film adaptations. And I, I, I don't want you to feel like you had some nobody last year, and now you're finally getting an author all of America is talking about. So um, let's just act like we're the same on equal stature, and we'll go from there. Um, I asked uh, Chantal what people did previous years here, and she said a lot of people just give readings. And the problem, if you've ever been to a fiction reading, you know, they're, they can actually be kind of boring. Um, and I said, she said, some people did lectures on their books, um, which are even more boring. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to combine the two and just be so boring, goes back around to interesting, and to boring again, back to interesting. So we'll do that. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll talk about Capitol, like what I was thinking about when I wrote it. I'll read some excerpts from it. And uh, then we'll do Q and A. So in my uh, in my early and mid twenties, I was armed with an English degree and a can't do spirit, and I cobbled together a number of low paying writing, editing, and teaching jobs in New York City. This was the early two thousands, uh, so much of my work was conducted exclusively over the internet. For a few of these jobs, I never once spoke with or, or even met my employers. Uh, my main source of income for a couple of years was editing business school application essays through website. So applicants would send their essays in, uh, they'd get farmed out to me and other editors, we'd send them back with revisions and suggestions, sometimes exchanging emails, but really nothing else. I worked from home, which didn't help foster much of a sense of community either. Um, if my life flashes before my eyes when I die, I hope it skips over these years. <laughs> now, the majority of the applicants were from uh, Japan, China, and South Korea. So you might, as you might expect, their grammatical and idi idiomatic command of English was often less than perfect, which uh, provided occasional comic relief from the tedium of editing for eight hours a day. I, I recall this one gem from an aspiring MBA student. He said, um, I very much admire Professor Smith at your university. When I graduate, I expect I will take his shoes. In his defense, he, he was a kleptomaniacal footwear fetishist, so I shouldn't have, <laughs> I, I should have left that alone. But what impressed me most, I think, was the writers, their grasp of technological and financial jargon. Uh, they knew every buzzword and phrase of corporate speak. They didn't use their experience, they leveraged it. They spearheaded projects, they cultivated skill sets. They were self-starters and goal-oriented. This was itself almost a foreign language for someone like me, who was waking up at 11 each day and hadn't planned for much beyond my next micro microwavable meal. Yet, I felt the applicants had a distinctly American way of speaking and thinking, too. Uh, so one day, while languishing in my apartment in seclusion, with little experience to leverage and a restricted skill set, I formulated a long-term goal. Someday, I would write a novel based on the composite voice of these applicants, transforming their sterile tongue into literary song while dissecting the postmodern language of late capitalism. <laughs> but first, a nap. <laughs> After a couple years on the job, I was fired over email, which seems only fitting. <laughs> Fortunately, I was heading off to graduate school in a few months for a master's in fiction writing. Halfway through my first year, I began working on Capitol, which started with figuring out the voice of the protagonist. I'd enjoyed various novels over the years that employed English as a second language narration, but felt they often mocked their foreigner protagonists for cheap laughs with a Borat-like pidgin English. So what if I asked, what if, I asked myself, I ventriloquized a character who spoke stiffly, but had a more acute sense of grammar 
and a greater curiosity about words than most native speakers? And what if, instead of rolling out his English mostly for comic effect, his idiosyncratic phrasing sometimes verged on the poetic? And what if his language evolved over the course of the novel as he added new vocabulary and became more comfortable with the rudiments of English? And finally, why are my mental questions to myself delivered with such complex diction and syntax? <laughs> it's almost like they aren't really thoughts I'm having in the present, but carefully worded statements I've imposed in the future for a talk to be held in Central Oregon. <laughs> it's incredibly prescient back then. So in the first chapter of Capitol, the protagonist, whose name is Kareem Asar, is a young computer programmer from Qatar, Doha, Qatar, uh, flying into work in New York in 1999. And he explains early on why he's narrating in English. He's keeping a journal throughout this. Uh, he traces his, ling his linguistic roots and exercises his occasional lyrical flourish. So this is from the first chapter. Several of the American financial magazines I read advise recording a journal for self-actualization. And I'm additionally doing it to enhance my English. But he, his seatmate, will not appreciate that or my two other motivations. One, I hypothesize that writing your thoughts is a way of deciphering precisely what you truly feel. And it is especially valuable if you have a problem. Similar to how writing a computer program helps you decipher the solution to a real world problem. And two, recording my experiences is also integral to remembering precise ideas and moments from my time in the US. I have a robust memory for some details, but it is complex to continue acquiring data and archive them all. And even I now am forgetting some memories, as if my brain is a hard drive and time is, and is a magnet. The captain says we should complete our customs forms ASAP. And I researched the term in the book I contain a copy of in my other pocket, which I also gave to Sahira, the International Business Person's Guide to English, which self-defines on the reverse cover as an indispensable compendium of English financial jargon and idioms for the global per business person, from actionable to zombie bonds. There's also a void in the rear for the owner to record more jargon terms, as I do frequently. Even though my knowledge base of English, is financial, of English financial jargon is already broad for a foreigner because of my nighttime classes in programming and mathematics and economics. The chief flight attendant commands us to power off electronics. We angle down to New York City, and the skyscrapers of Manhattan aggregate like tall flowers in the garden, and the grids of orange lights look like LEDs on a circuit board. So as one of his coworkers later observes, he has a uniquely Kareem-esque way of speaking. But I didn't want Capitol to focus only on the vocabulary of the business world. As an outsider with a highly analytical mind, Kareem scrutinizes our culture and language, and at times, has better insight into them than those who live here. Or as Kareem puts it when he's in the car taking him home from JFK Airport, he notices in the rear view of a mirror a small scar above the driver's, quote, right eyebrow, which looks like his left eyebrow in the mirror. It is like debugging a program. Sometimes you do not truly observe something until you study it in reverse. Just as I want to avoid recycling the archetype of the foreigner who butchers English, I hope to skirt the classic depiction of the alien bumbler who's completely ignorant, ignorant of his new surroundings. Even when Kareem's attempts at bridging cultural chasms fail, he generally understands why, as when he visits his first New York nightclub and talks to a Korean American woman. Angela ends her telephone call and asks me questions about my family. I provide the basic details, such as the names of my father and sister and uncle. But when she asks what they do, I say, if I told you, I would have to kill you which I heard on a comedy television show the previous night, <laughs> even though I didn't find the threat of murder amusing, but the audience did. She laughs and places her hand on my leg. I feel myself rising. It's strange how you're from Qatar and my family's originally from Korea and now we're meeting in New York, she says. That's so random. Americans frequently misuse the word random, I say. <laughs> Merely because an incident is unlikely does not mean it is random. I believe if we were able to analyze every variable of the current situation, which is of course impossible, we could determine that our meeting was in fact predetermined. Therefore, when people say something is so random, they should truly say that it is so destined. She smiles but does not respond to my observation. <laughs> Instead, she says, I feel badly that we're not talking to the others. Is your tactile sense operating inefficiently? What do you mean, she asks. 
you used the adverbial form of I feel bad to express a negative emotion and said I feel badly, which means your sense of touch is performing poorly. <laughs> Again, she smiles and says nothing. I certify that this is the last time I will note anything about usage or grammar to an American. Um, but this is, I've, I've, this is I think, the one part of the novel that's totally implausible because I, I have a sense that uh, correcting a woman's grammar when you're hitting on her is a total aphrodisiac to most women. <laughs> so while language and cultural mores are barriers to connection with those Americans, Kareem's outsiderness is a great advantage in his work as a computer programmer and financial analyst. Unlike his more conformist colleagues, he's inclined to think outside the box, to borrow one of the Id business idioms he learns, in whose cliched usage he later points out is a paradoxical example of not thinking outside the box. The fir first stock market program he writes is a result of his unorthodox Kareem-esque thought process, and introduces his bedrock belief in the predictive abilities of mathematics. The inspiration, um, however, comes from a few unlikely sources after he overhears two, two co-workers, uh, Dan and Jefferson, discuss a trade in fantasy baseball. I take the subway to the Museum of Modern Art after work to utilize my free access as a shrub employee. The business section of the New York Times is on the plastic subway seat next to me, and I read about a merger on Tuesday between two startup companies that raise their stock. A merger is similar to a mutually beneficial trade, although of course there is no way an investor could know about it before it occurs without insider trading. But possibly there's a way to predict news like this without insider trading. E.g., what if I can decipher that a merger or another major transaction will take place via public data and then predict if the stock will rise or plummet? Dan performed normal research for his trade, but all financial workers do this for stocks and companies, so it is difficult to gain advantage. I can merely hope my research is the most accurate. My brain continues to evaluate this idea as I walk through the museum exhibits. The paintings of the Dutchman Piet Mondrian intrigue me, as they look like city streets, and one of his famous paintings is, is titled New York City. His lines are perfectly straight like geometric Islamic designs, and would extend infinitely if the frames did not restrict them. Then I enter an exhibit on the American Jackson Pollock. At first I do not enjoy his paintings. They are too chaotic, and have no logic and organization like Mondrian's. I could have painted the same thing, and so could many other painters. Only Pollock was the originator, and therefore he receives all the kudos. Paintings of this class make me feel like I do not understand why people appreciate visual art. But then I see some quotations by Pollock about his paintings, such as, I don't use the accident, because I deny the accident. And I reevaluate that possibly Pollock's paintings have more value, because he has a philosophy similar to mine which is that life is ultimately predictable. Many people believe it is science that controls life, or Allah, or some other spiritual energy. And in my opinion also, we do not have true free will. E.g., my conscious decisions are the product of my neurons, and not my will as an independent agent. Therefore, the variables that appear to be chaotic, in fact exist in the environment for us to collect and analyze, and make predictions from. This is how many systems function, like the weather and bend, and although some people believe it is impossible, the stock market. When I was 11, my friend Rocky kicked a soccer ball through the window of our elderly neighbor Mamdou's apartment. All the other children, including Rocky, ran away, which upset me since my team required only one more goal to win. But I forgot about the score and remained because the pieces of glass on the ground looked like icicles, which I previously saw photographs of exclusively. And I studied their shapes for several minutes, as well as the patterns of cracks in the window that look like spider webs, and the parallels between the cracks, and the arrangement of glass on the ground, and that is how Mamdou detected me. My father commanded me to labor at the store until I could pay for the window. He knew I hated laboring there. I frequently complained as a child that it was too small for me to run around in, and when I was older, it always bothered me how disorganized the items were. I said it was not my fault. He asked who kicked the ball, Rakid's family was poorer than ours, so I said I kicked it. But I also innovated a clever explanation. I argued that because events are predetermined as Qadr and I allow al mafuz where Allah writes all that has happened and will happen, it means it, will not, it was not truly my fault. My father said that everything we do belongs to Allah and to us equally. He also said something that I've always remembered because I read later that it was a strategic technique 
for parents as it makes the child want to enhance his behavior. And I used it with Zahira on the few occasions when she did not perform well in school. I'm not angry with you, he said. I'm disappointed. Then he made me labor twice as long at the store so I could not only repay for the broken window, but also buy new Qurans for both Mamdu and me. But merely because something is predictable and destined does not mean it is logical outside the world of numbers. E.g., a scientist with infinite resources could have predicted my mother's breast cancer by analyzing her biological properties and her environment. But she was not personally responsible at all for becoming unhealthy, even though my father argued that we were responsible for everything. In the museum, there's another Pollock quotation that intrigues me even more. My paintings do not have a center, but depend on the same amount of interest throughout. I read it just after I notice that it is difficult to focus on his paintings. And then I have an idea. And although the typical image to represent having an idea is a light bulb powering on, for me, I visualize the stars slowly becoming visible in the nighttime sky. Because one, like a strong idea, they were always present. But two, it requires the correct conditions to observe them. And three, make connections between them. My idea is, I can use Pollock's ideas about denying the accident and about there being no center for stock market program. Everyone else who writes programs to predict the stock market concentrates on the most central variables and incorporates a few minor ones. But what if I utilize the variables that no one observes because they seem tangential and I utilize exclusively these tangential variables? I would have an advantage like Dan had in his fantasy baseball trade where he used tangential data instead of central data. And because I'm a tangential, a tangential foreign banker in the US, possibly I will have a greater chance of locating these tangential data, e.g. as a parallel, because I'm not a native English speaker, I must pay closer attention to its grammar, and therefore I detected the error Dan made that most Americans also make when use data as a singular noun. And possibly I will predict events that other people consider random accidents. Although this program eventually fails, Kareem later updates it with another wrinkle that also stems from his foreignness. After one of his coworkers mentions how the bombing of an embassy in Iran is so common, it's, quote, not even front page news, Kareem recognizes a correlation between news coverage of instability in the Middle East and the price of oil futures. His attention to the nuances of language and his outsider status filter into the program, which carefully parses word usage and pays special attention to overlooked news. As he describes it, Because the algorithm is automated and it analyzes every word in an article, it also selects many words that I think no one else would pay attention to, such as bitter and weary and resigned, as in this sentence. The prime minister, after a round of bitter questioning, appeared weary and resigned. I think these kinds of words can in fact be more important because A, by the time a bombing has occurred, e.g. everyone knows about it and they can predict what will happen to oil prices and they act accordingly. B, but fewer people read about a politician appearing weary and resigned after receiving bitter questions. C, a few people do read it, however, and they begin acting in a predictable way. Then a few more people follow their lead, and more and more, until it becomes almost as if everyone did read it, even though they did not. Four, I can aid the automated algorithm by examining articles manually, and as someone whose native language is not English, I must pay closer attention to the words to produce logic from them, and sometimes I observe things others do not about English. Five, there, by the way, this started at three. It's, it's, not, it's not like I don't have a count or anything like that. Uh, five, therefore, if I can collect enough data like this, I can gain a major advantage over others who are merely using obvious data that are front page news. Capitol is set in the end of 1999. In graduate school in St. Louis, I read uh, Ian McEwan's novel, Atonement. Uh, though it's set in a British country house in 1935, the story can be read, I think, as an allegory for Neville Chamberlain's appeasement of Hitler in 1938. The concept of this retrospective foreshadowing in which the reader is aware of what is to come but the characters themselves are not appealed to me and seemed like a novel approach to writing about September 11th, which I'm guessing on, about this, but I'm guessing that based on its enormity and the prevalence of, uh, of modern media and the power of modern media, is possibly the single most written about uh, day in world history. By setting the book before the term 9-11 was ever coined, I could avoid repeating what many others, especially nonfiction writers, had already said better, 
and I could sidestep polemicism, which is death to vital fiction. Instead, I hope to survey our post-9-11 world from this oblique angle and examine how and why we ended up where we are now by investigating the end of the 20th century. As with Atonement's understated pre-war allegory, the reader can draw whatever connections he will from Capitol's pre-9-11 environment to our current one. There are two other reasons to have Kareem arrive in New York in October 1999, uh, mostly having to do with the response to the art that September 11th produced. One of the tropes of what's become known as the 9-11 the novel is a description of the fundamental anxiety that liberal elite white New Yorkers felt in the early aughts, a decade so chaotic we never even agreed upon a name for it. Uh, this genre has become widespread because a disproportionate number of published novelists are themselves liberally elite white New Yorkers. Um, I've totally bucked the trend on this one. <laughs> I'm just a rebel like that. Uh, there are some excellent examples of this type of novel, such as Joseph O'Neill's Netherland, uh, Claire Massoud's The Emperor's Children, more recently James Hines's Next, but I didn't think I had anything new to say about it. The flip side is writing about Muslims in America after 9-11. Again, there's some standout work. I really like uh, Mohsin Hamid's The Reluctant Fundamentalist. But I think that in general, nonfiction such as Dave Eggers' Zaytun um, provides so many searing, incredible but true accounts that a fictional example can seem superfluous. Or at least I, I certainly didn't feel I had the authority to relate the, the post 9-11 Muslim experience in America. Moreover, when white writers like myself have written about Muslims in the last decade, this really goes for, for movies and TV even more so, uh, they tend to slot them into two binaries, either as terrorists or victims of xenophobic persecution. The latter is a worthier characterization and goal, but again, I didn't think I could add anything original to this. So the plot of Capitol is about a young Muslim male who works in the World Trade Center and who creates a program that predicts oil futures based on articles about Middle Eastern instability and terrorism. Uh, by the way, my flight over here I stupidly left my laptop in, in my bag when I checked it through the x-ray, so they had to take it out and do a chemical swab of my, of my suitcase. And it tested positive for explosives. Um, and I thought for the first time in my life, I considered pulling rank. I've never done this at all. And, and showing my copy of Capitol on the back and saying, hey, I, I wrote this book, I'm not a terrorist. I realized this is the wrong book to use for that. It's not a get out of jail free card. And I got a, a search also, which is, it is a weird experience. And he asked, do you want to go behind a screen? I felt that was actually more in, weirdly invasive to be in private with the guy doing that. Um, so everything screams 9-11 about this book. Uh, in fact, when the book cover designer came up with, with his image of the Manhattan skyline bleeding into an oil drip, I asked him to try a version of the World Trade Center at the middle instead of the Empire State Building. Yet the novel never gets to 2001. And because of that, the reader can view Kareem's Muslimness not as his defining characteristic, because the story itself rarely puts it center stage. If the novel works as I intended it, Kareem's a uh, brilliant computer programmer, an ambivalent capitalist, a protective brother, a conflicted son, a yearning romantic, an awkward communicator, a somewhat disoriented foreigner. He also happens to be modern Muslim. The different thematic threads I've touched upon tonight all revolve around the idea of alienation. Kareem's language is alien. His thought process is alien. His national and religious backgrounds are alien. So while the novel is in the abstract about capitalism and geopolitical strife and determinism, the heart of it, to me, concerns the very relatable problem of human connection. Kareem Issar is someone who, at first glance, could be dismissed as machine-like, completely out of touch with his emotions. He speaks robotically. He works in a hyper-rational numerical field. Uh, he often thinks in outline form, as you've seen. Yet above all else, he desires poetic intimacy with other people who he comes to recognize cannot be predicted and quantified as easily as the stock market. His humanistic education arrives in the form of his coworker, Rebecca, who introduces Kareem to several aspects of American culture that are not on his radar. And he was as fearful but desirous of intimacy as Kareem is unpracticed in it. So all these ideas, to me, coalesce in this chapter in which uh, Kareem goes to a party in Brooklyn that Rebecca is thrown with her roommate, with roommate Jessica. Journal date recorded, November 6th. 
Rebecca's building didn't have an elevator. A female with short blonde hair, like a boy's with plastic clips in it, answered the door. She held a drink and wore a black dress that was the, the class of dresses on old movie stars. Hello, she said, as if she were singing a note. I didn't hear anyone else inside. I tried to look, to look into the room, but I didn't see anyone. Is this the apartment of Rebecca Goldman? It is. You're Kareem, I take it? The solitary way she could know my name was if Rebecca had talked to her about me, which would be positive, but only if she gave me kudos. Is this the night of the party, I asked. It is indeed the night of the party. You're a little early, hot stuff. In fact, I wasn't early because the invitation stated the party started at 10 o'clock p.m. and it was 10.04 p.m. But I didn't correct her. She told me her name was Jessica and waved for me to follow her inside and dance as she walked to the sounds of a fast song that I didn't recognize, then yelled for Rebecca. Rebecca entered in jeans and an informal shirt, which I'd never seen her wear before. This is for your guests, I said, and offered her a container of mamoul that I had baked and juice I had poured into a two-liter bottle of Coke. And for you, of course. Thank you. She put the container on the table with the other food and held the juice. I hope Jessica didn't scare you off. No, she's not scary, I said. Can I fix you a drink, Jessica asked. I make a mean mojito. Before I could respond, Rebecca said, hey, don't start stealing away my guest. She directed me to give my coat to Jessica and to come into the kitchen, where there were several bottles of liquor and also non-alcoholic beverages. She handed me a red plastic cup. Have whatever you like, or, or your juice. I told her about the juice previously at work and urged her to have it because it is high in antioxidants. She tried it once and said she disliked the flavor. I told her most things people dislike are in fact healthy for them. I didn't want to repeat what happened the previous weekend when he got very drunk and, and sort of made a scene. But I also didn't want Rebecca to think I was someone who never experienced fun. So I said, I would like one beer if you have any. She took a bottle out of the refrigerator and opened it rapidly with a bottle opener. When she transferred it to me, our fingers briefly contacted. I haven't seen you around the office much lately, she said. I've been working overtime. Right, on your little Manhattan project. Then neither of us said anything. And I was nervous because we were alone in the kitchen and the only sounds derived from the stereo. I was glad when the doorbell rang. The guests were a man with a black beard he continuously petted and a female who wore glasses with thick frames shaped like the eyes of a cat. Rebecca hugged them and offered them some food on the table. The female said, is that Mamoul? Rebecca asked me to confirm it and I said, yes. Where'd you buy it? The female asked. I can't find it anywhere. She picked one up and put it in her mouth. I, I said, and then I stopped myself and waited for her to eat it. I didn't want to convert her judgment because she knew its origin. This is so good, she said. John, try one. It's a cookie stuffed with dates. I baked them myself, I said. But I wanted to wait for you to eat it before I confessed. Everyone laughed, although I didn't intend, it, intend for it to be a joke. The female wiped off her hand and held it out. I'm Eleanor, and this is my partner, John. You have a business together, I asked. A business? Then she laughed again. Oh, no, I, I meant we're domestic partners. I understand, I said. My name is Kareem. Rebecca and I are international work partners. <laughs> I waited for the others to laugh at my joke, but no one did. And in fact, no one said anything, and it was tense, until Eleanor asked where I came from. I told her, and she said she was an artist and had studied Middle Eastern art, and she wanted to go there someday. John asked me questions about Qatar because he was a journalist and knew we had just had our first election since our independence in 1971. I was happy to discuss politics, as I hadn't truly done that yet in New York. Rebecca's interested in the topic, but she's always nervous when discussing it with me, so our conversations don't have much breadth. After an hour of conversing with them, the room had become full, but I wasn't anxious. A few more people joined our conversation, and at one point I saw that Rebecca was watching us from across the room, but she turned her eyes away when I detected her. And then Jessica requested that we all dance. And although I'm not a sexy dancer, despite my athletic skills, it was enjoyable. And I continued for, we continued for a long time to songs I hadn't heard of, because they weren't of the class that reaches Cutter. Rebecca joined us halfway through, and we danced near each other several times. But every time she came close, it was like we were magnets with similar poles, and she moved away. She left after a period of time and talked with a few men who had thin beards and glasses like hers, and wore unconventional materials that blended in with everyone else's, unlike my suit. And I kept watching her, even though I attempted not to. I didn't want to join her cluster, because I was the only one who didn't wear glasses, and I would stand out like a syntax error in a program, even though my eyes were not defective and theirs were. 
I also didn't understand what they were discussing, e.g. one of the men who was not shaved and had very long black hair with a green rubber band in the, ear, in the rear said in a very deep voice, I didn't say I disliked the Archdukes of Hazard. I said they were derivative of so many late 70s New York punk bands that I'd rather just listen to the original singers, which incidentally would be a good punk band name, the original singers. And Rebecca said, James, you're such an elitist and obscurantist. And he said, using the words elitist and obscurantist is a performative sentence that renders the speaker an elitist and obscurantist as well. Reader Austin. And she said, you suck, perform that sentence. But she smiled and lightly struck him on the shoulder. Jessica left to talk with Rebecca and her friends. And she returned to our circle and asked, anyone for weed? Everyone else said, yes. You want to have some fun, Kareem? Jessica said. I said loudly, yes, I would like to have some fun. She said, all right. And we all followed her to Rebecca in the corner. Rebecca watched me closely. She whispered, you know what this is, right? I'm not a child, I said, I know about marijuana. Okay, sorry, she said. Jessica retrieved from the closet a tall red plastic cylinder that had a metal smoking pipe attached to it. She took it to the kitchen, and when she returned, the cylinder was partially filled with water. One of the men removed a clear bag with marijuana in it. He inserted his fingers into the bag to pinch a small quantity, as if his hand were a machine that picked up dirt, and carefully deposited it in the pipe. I observed him closely so that when it was my turn, I would not humiliate myself. He covered a small hole in the cylinder with his index finger while he moved an activated lighter over the marijuana. Then he inhaled from the cylinder and simultaneously removed his index finger. The smoke passed through the water, and I hypothesized that it made it less carcinogenic and softer for the lungs, which made me less nervous about inhaling it, as I've never even used a hookah. Then he contained his breath for over 10 seconds before he exhaled the smoke like a factory chimney. After he finished, he said, that's a totally groovy bong, dude, in an intentionally false and high voice. And everyone else laughed with him, although I didn't know why. And I decided I should not make any more jokes in the US because I still didn't understand the logic of humor here. He shifted the bong clockwise to the next person. I was next, and while the female next to me inhaled, Rebecca looked at me again as if she were afraid for me. When I received the bong, I inflamed the marijuana for a long time and inhaled strongly. The water inside made a quiet, bubbling sound that was pleasing. And then the marijuana smoke reached my lungs, and it burned and produced tears in my eyes. But I closed them and continued inhaling as if we, I were a machine that could proceed infinitely. When I was finally done, Jessica said, damn, cream knows how to parte. And I still contained my breath for even longer than the previous two people. By the time I exhaled, there were just a few clouds of smoke, so I'd absorbed the lion's share of it and was using the product efficiently. I felt slightly imbalanced, but I was not truly inebriated yet. They passed the bong around the circle, and the originator, a the originator asked if we were up for another round. A few people, including Rebecca, said they had inhaled a sufficient amount. But Jessica said she wanted more, and asked if I did, and I said, if you have enough remaining, I would like some more. Not only because I wanted to see what the true sensation was like, but also to show Rebecca that I knew how to party. I watched the first man produce another cloud of smoke. I thought about how it was previously the marijuana plant, which came in a larger shipment that was probably sold by a drug dealer with a small income, who bought it in a much larger shipment from a drug dealer with a larger income, and so on, and was transported into this country by a drug dealer with an even larger income, and originally derived from marijuana plants in the ground, but that it was picked by someone with a very small income. It is always a valuable exercise to evaluate how a product arrives at its consumer, because it shows how many middlemen there are and whose labor helps determine the market price. When the smoke contacted my lungs on the next round, it didn't burn at all. My body instantly felt lighter, as if someone had rotated a dial and reduced the gravity in the room. After I handed the bong to Jessica, I thought about how, one, the party was not stimulating the economy, because most of what the guests consumed for entertainment at the party, minus the alcohol, was either essentially free all the food was homemade, although the raw materials were purchased elsewhere, or not purchased from a store, the marijuana, or was previously purchased and reused, e.g. the music. A. But then it also meant the guests were not paying for middlemen or advertising. B. And ultimately, they were creating a product, a social event providing entertainment, from almost nothing, via creativity and cooperation. I. Which is impossible in the physical world in which matter cannot be created or destroyed. 
one. But this is how human emotions and intangible products differ from objects. A, and the most powerful material slash emotion that you truly derive from nothing is love, which does not require a source and has no limit. I, e.g., I've infinitely loved Sahira since the first time I saw her and will always feel that way. As I concluded this thought, I observed Rebecca more closely than I would normally, especially the small area between her lips and her nose and the soft angles of the two vertical lines there. And I almost became imbalanced, but I put my hand on the wall and remained vertical. I could hear the blood zooming in my ears like water boiling in a teapot and I licked my dry lips. I craved water, but I couldn't go to the kitchen because I did not want anyone to see me in that condition. I went down a hallway to a restroom on the other side of the apartment. The restroom was locked, so I leaned against the wall. It hurt my back and I plummeted slowly until I was sitting. That was uncomfortable also. And then I noticed an open door to another room. Multiple coats covered the bed in a pile like a bowl of colorful herbs. And I considered that if coats were allowed to be on the bed, then I could be as well. The room had only a small lamp on for minimal light. A picture of Rebecca's brother was on the table by the bed, next to a black and white picture of a young woman with long straight hair who looked like Rebecca. Three framed paintings hung on her walls of men's faces in colors such as orange and blue and green that looked like the inverted true colors. A bottle of prescription pills was next to her pictures. I rotated it to read the label. Rebecca Goldman, Zoloft, take daily with food, 150 milligrams. I rotated it back and reviewed the paintings. The men looked like aliens. Their faces were very angry and sad simultaneously. And my heart accelerated and my skin perspired at what felt like an infinite number of points. I sat on the bed where there weren't any coats and reclined and closed my eyes because the ceiling looked like it was spinning. Then I grew very panicked because I knew I did not have complete control over my thoughts anymore. I didn't want to be at the party anymore and I regretted inhaling marijuana smoke only to impress Rebecca. I tried to regulate my breathing, but I was inhaling shallowly. And then a voice said, here. And a cold, wet cloth was on my forehead and absorbing the perspiration. And when I opened my eyes, Rebecca was leaning over me. She said, you've been gone almost half an hour, even though it seemed like only a few minutes. I'm not feeling well, I said. She continued petting my forehead, just stay still. We stayed like that for a few minutes, and my breathing deepened. Do you think some slow music will help, she asked, and I nodded. I closed my eyes and focused on the words of the stinger on the stereo, she said was named Leonard Cohen, and it helped reroute my brain from panicking. The line, your hair upon the pillow like a sleepy golden storm, especially helped, because I had to mentally link the two images, and it was a logical connection I'd never previously considered. And after he sang that, I opened my eyes, and Rebecca's hair was now hanging down on the pillow, like falling black water, and covering everything else around my face like a cylinder. And all I could see was her face looking down at me. And my body felt more stabilized. Who produced these paintings, I asked. My brother, she said. He studied art since he was little. Zahira is artistic as well. I didn't know what else to say in that position. But my father discouraged her from taking classes like that when she was young. That's a shame, she said. Girls can do whatever they want here. She removed the cloth from my forehead. Then she lowered her head, and her hair touched my face like feathers. Her eyes fluctuated quickly from my eyes to my chest, and her warm breath moved over me, and my heart accelerated again. I said, Rebecca, because the silence felt like shallow breaths again, and she didn't answer. So I said her name again, and she said, God, it's been a while. I wasn't certain what she was referring to, but I had an idea. So I said, then possibly, before I could finish my sentence, which is going to be, then possibly we should first discuss the situation from other angles. She sat up and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is a mistake. She kept saying the word mistake to herself as she stood up and moved away from the bed. I said I was feeling enhanced and should go home, even though I was perspiring again, and tried to find my coat. The pile was large, and Rebecca stood there while I searched. She said, you must think I'm a real shithead, which almost made me laugh after I'd analyzed the word. But because I didn't know how to respond, I looked around while I continued feeling through the pile and saw her blue wool hat on her desk. I said, that is a nice hat, and she said, my mother knitted it for me. And suddenly I became very sad thinking about her mother producing a hat for her, 
even though there is, of course, nothing truly sad about it for her. But I could feel pressure behind my eyes, so I refocused on the pile and finally found my coat at the bottom and said I would see her on Monday. I walked out while holding it, and I exited the party without saying goodbye to anyone and took a taxi home. So I'm often asked uh, how similar I am to Kareem. Uh, on the surface, clearly I'm not, right? I'm, I'm not a computer programmer. I've never worked in finance. I'm not Muslim. I'm not from Qatar. My family does not resemble his at all. Uh, the last math class I took was in 12th grade. But I do feel, I think, a deeper identi emotional identification with him, uh, particularly about his outsider status, unify, you know, blend in more easily, and my social skills, as he would say, are a little bit more enhanced. Uh, which brings me into why this experience is, is personally meaningful to me. Um, when you publish a book, especially the first book, it is very exciting, um, but it quickly becomes a full-time job, not that I'm complaining. Uh, you turn into a publicity machine. You, you hustle to give interviews. You write essays about it. You promote it through social networks. You do readings for strangers who've never met you and who probably will never read your book. Um, I know you guys have. Thank you. It's, it's necessary work because otherwise people won't pay attention when there are other books to read. Um, not to mention movies, TV shows, YouTube videos, Charlie Sheen. There's just too much out there. I wrote this a few weeks ago. We'll substitute Donald Trump right now. The problem, though, is that you can easily forget why you wrote the book in the first place. Um, you forget you once wrote it to articulate something important to you that might possibly be important to others. You forget that you spent three and a half years inventing a human being who shared many of your desires and fears and that this was the best and maybe only way for you to express them. You forget that you once had a series of unpleasant jobs to pay your rent, and now you're fortunate to be able to do this for a living. And although my new job now does allow me to reach out to others in a way editing business school essays did not, I still usually don't get to meet them in person, and certainly not on this scale, which is something I never could have imagined in all those days I spent alone at my desk writing a novel I doubted would ever get published. So I'm very grateful to you all for coming tonight, uh, for reading Capitol, for participating in the Novel Read program, and for giving me this gift of readerly connection, which is to me an unconventional type of intimacy that feels distinctly Kareem-esque. Thanks again. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please hear it for Mr. Teddy Wayne?